Hey everyone, welcome back. Hey, today we have a past guest here who's actually been building something really cool with AI, which is a really nice evolution of where their product has been. So, hey, Nick, welcome back to the show. I'm really cool to have you back. Great to be back on HA. I enjoyed doing this last time and really excited to talk to your audience. Cool. Well, Nick Desai and your wife, they have the new companies together, or the evolution of the companies together with Renee, which is a cool, I, lo I love it when people name companies after someone they love. So they have the new together with Renee app and it's on iPhone app store. It's on the iPhone app store at together, together by Renee on the yeah. iPhone app store. <laughs> well, I kind of found it cool when you guys had reached out because you know, we've been, we've talked with a few people who've been playing with different AI and just I think, as everyone has noticed in the past year, we've kind of gone from mm, maybe it's something and you know it's going to be in the future to like, oh, it's really pretty cool. And there's some really great things happening. And I love the angle because healthcare is such a difficult subject to find good help, to find good advice. And, you know, your target market, given that you were previously looking at older people and helping them. AI right. just seems like it would be such a great way to reduce cost and to move forward and help people, you know, better service people at a lower. So why don't we start with like, why did you guys start exploring with AI and maybe kind of talk to the audience given that we're a lot of business owners who are thinking like, how do I start thinking about it? Do I incorporate it? Do I use tools? Where did you guys come into this, you know, thought process of together with Renee? Right. So overall, in my personal case, my obsession with generative AI goes back almost over three decades because I studied electrical engineering and the concept of what was neural networks is effectively evolved to being what is generative AI. But I would say to any business owner, embrace this sooner rather than later, because if you don't use it, it's going to use you and use you right out of business, right? If we think that the internet disrupted retail, this is going to disrupt every white collar customer service desk job in America, right? And that can be for a very good thing and it can be not so great depending on how you use it. The most important thing to think about AI, generative AI, what does all this even mean and all that stuff is there are two huge limitations to computing and computers as we understand them before AI that are removed by AI. And those two are context and syntax, right? I'll describe what I mean by both of them. When people think about calling any business now, you get that recording and you have to navigate it, the IVR as it's called. Yeah. Press one for this or say why you're calling and the machine doesn't understand you. And even if a not well-trained minimum wage employee answered the phone and you said, let's say you were calling a pharmacy for a refill, right? And you call and you call one of the biggest pharmacy chains in America, any of them, you will get a machine that says, tell me what you want to do in a few words. But those machines don't really understand background noise. They don't understand accents. They want syntax in a very specific way, right? You have to say the words pharmacy refill or medication refill, and you have to choose from that list. Whereas if you talk to a human being, you could say, I'm out of my pills. I need more pills. I need a medication refill. I need a prescription refill. I need a refill. You could say it with any accent. You could say it with a lot of background noise. And by and large, that person would understand and know exactly what you're talking about because they're a human being, right? The, that is an example of both context and syntax. You don't have to speak in a specific way. In the person, the human being is able to understand the context of what you're talking about. You're calling a drugstore. You're not calling it to order a pizza, right? You're calling it to do something to do with medications or a ski resort or an airline or a pizza place, right? You're not calling a pizza place to order a refill on your medications. The context in syntax, that's what AI removes from computing. The ability to understand input in any number of formats, right? If I say to you, my name is Nick Desai, I'm 53 years old and I'm an electrical engineer and I run a business versus I run a business, I'm 53 years old, my name is Nick Desai, and I'm an electrical engineer, AI will understand that equally well and parse it and figure out what part of that information goes. The likelihood, yeah. And because of that, the people who are least adaptive or least willing to put up with the pain 
of computing in the traditional sense are typically the oldest amongst us, right? Those people can benefit the most from AI because it makes it friendly to them, right? What what we are, we have a sort of a saying that I, I live by, which is a user should not have to learn an app. An app should learn the user, right? My parents are not, they're very bright, older people, but they're not computing people and they hate those machines. And my dad, you, you should see him react to an IVR, but he understands how to use a TV remote control on his TV because it's intuitive. The right. same way we have to make technology intuitive and AI presents that potential. So for us, in context of creating a healthcare assistant that helped complete and automate daily healthcare tasks that are critical to improving healthcare, and with an audience focus, we had a desired audience of people over 55 years old as our primary audience. It was incredibly important to use AI because it could make a product that was incredibly easy for our target users to use in a way that most other healthcare products are not. Yeah, we talked last time, you know, and you and I were chatting a little before. My mother in her 70s has had some health issues, and it is very difficult sort of navigating all the advice, all the thing, the contradictions, all this. And that help is what's so interesting. So first, how are you seeing this uptake? You're saying that you're seeing, you know, people are adapting to it a lot faster, you know, the target and all their audience. But like, what's their response? Like, how is that moment where they go, oh, okay, this is not me having to figure something out? Because that's always my mom's worry, that she has to figure something out and she's going to make a mistake. We've marketed sort of the positioning statement that we came up with, ironically, with the help of AI, right? We fed into yeah. AI and said, I want to say this to this audience very easily. And it came up with the phrase magically easy. And magic in our minds conjures up this I have no idea how it works, but it does something really cool, right? In, in all human beings, that, that word has that connotation, and that's the way we approach healthcare. And the, what we did is, separate from that phrase, uh, the, reason, uh, the way we made that phrase come to life is we interviewed a lot of aging Americans, and we asked them, and what they hate is data entry, right? Mm -hmm. Typing stuff on the, on the computer, right? And misspelling it. How the hell do you spell you know, every Rosuva statin in the first place, right? That's Crestor, but most people take the generic and how do you spell it? So we decided that we would use pictures and video, right? What my parents and what every grandparent out there knows how to do is take pictures of their grandkids. If they can do that in our app, you take a picture and you start, for example, by taking a picture of your prescription medication bottles. So let's say you take five prescription medications and you take a picture of each bottle. From that picture, our AI is able to extract, not just, hey, you should take this medicine at six o'clock every evening with milk and send you a reminder to do that. That's the easy part. But who's the doctor who prescribed this medicine? Because that's on the bottle and we can extract. Mm -hmm. And not just, hey, Dr. Smith prescribed this, but you live in Los Angeles, California in this zip code, and this is a medicine for heart disease. So of the many Dr. Smiths, this is the wrong Dr. Smith who actually prescribed it, right? What is a pharmacy where you got it? When is the refill due, right, for this medicine? And what is the underlying health issue? You're not taking a cholesterol medication because you're a 25-year-old person that's eaten spinach their whole life, right? There are underlying health issues. Based on those underlying health issues, what is the preventive health exam you're most likely to need? Let me take my own example. I'm a 53-year-old man. I'm a couple of ounces over ideal body weight. This is obvious yeah, on this video. I know that feeling. <laughs> and, and, and I take a medicine for cholesterol and I take a medicine for blood pressure. So our AI is able to extract and say, Nick, you need to get a blood sugar test every six months to make sure you're not developing type 2 diabetes. Okay. Well, great. But we go beyond that because remember you took a picture of the pill bottle. So we know who my primary care doctor is who prescribed the medicines in the first place. And then our AI will call that doctor's office and schedule that blood sugar test. Nice. Yeah. And then put it on my calendar. And let's say I wasn't me, but I'm my 86-year-old father who doesn't drive himself to doctor's appointments anymore. He would put it on my calendar so that I would know that I have to drive my dad to the doctor's office. That is how we are using AI. Now, to answer your question, how do you that convince your mom? is when she hears about this app, it'll be typically on a local newscast. We've done a lot of local TV news. 
And aging Americans are the number one watchers of local TV news. And so they see it, they try it out, and they hear that it's free and it's private. So they try it, and they're skeptical at first. And then they take a picture of that first medicine bottle, and they see all that information. And they're like, wow, this is incredibly easy. Or they use the app to measure their blood pressure just by holding the camera phone up to their face for 45 seconds. Like, wow, this is really easy. And mm -hmm. it's that feeling. Recently for an investor, I had to speak to a half a dozen of our users, and they were all people in their 70s and 80s, all that hated apps otherwise, and all said universally, this is the easiest app they've ever used. In fact, they didn't know an app could be this easy. And it's not that older people have an unreasonable expectation of how easy technology should be. It's that technology has an unreasonable expectation of how much time people should be willing to spend to learn how to use the technology. When I order a pizza, I don't have to learn how to eat it. I shouldn't have to learn how to use an app either, right? And the best apps and services, Netflix, Uber, YouTube, these are things that it takes very easy. a fraction of a second to intuitive. You could just go to YouTube and click and start watching a video, another one show up and another one show up, and you can spend your whole life doing that. Well, I used to, and just as a quick aside on that thing, I used to laugh. My kids knew before they could read how to get to the different kids' videos because they would figure it out. Oh, if I go to this video, the suggested videos are going to be this. If I click on that, the suggested videos would be that. And they could tell by the pictures. And they could get the Blues Clues, whatever, you know, Thomas the Tank Engine. And I was always worried. <laughs> I was like, okay, where would you go off? But, yeah, it's like... YouTube and those things do make it so easy because they're not relying on you learning, yeah, you know, learning the pathways. Exactly. All right. So I just recently was talking to a company that they literally still rely on um, yellow pages. And I was like, couldn't believe they were like, oh, we target middle America and rural America, 60 plus year old people. And, you know, for services and they, you know, they have this big, call center in the Philippines and all this stuff. But because of their target audience, they found that yellow page ads really do work. And I was just like, I could not comprehend it, but I love that this is working you know, because it is something everyone's talking about. Oh, network news is dying, all this, but yet it's a perfect audience for yep. this offering. So it sounds like you're using multiple different types of ad because like, all right, Google has that whole like, We'll call for you, you know, is that, is it custom built? Are you using multiple connections? Is it API into a genitive a, chat GPT API? What are you, you know, how, yeah, so how our, are you? Our view is not to reinvent the wheel, right? I'm here in Silicon, in the heart of Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, California. And a stone's throw, metaphorically speaking, from my office are, multi, you know, OpenAI, which is valued at $90 billion now, and Google, yeah. which is a trillion-dollar company, and, and Anthropic, which just got $4 billion of investment capital, and all these other services and tools. And that's phenomenal. We are the application developer. We want to put these things to good use. So our app uses a combination of OpenAI, Google's Bard, Anthropic's Claude, Amazon's Lex, some custom stuff we built, some stuff from Apple Vision Kit, which is, you know, very futuristic yes. in terms of reading the pill bottle labels, some, all of these different things to accomplish the functions we want to accomplish in a way with the focus that the definition of in good innovation at our company is something that real people will benefit from because they will use. Nobody, you know, there's a saying in healthcare that you can't, the, the pill in the pill bottle, let's say there was a magic cure for every disease in America, but you have to swallow the pill and you don't, it won't cure your disease. The prescription won't yeah. cure the illness, right? You have to comply. You have to be adherent. You have to take the medicine, right? Similarly, the best technology isn't the one that we think is the best. It's the one that the most people use, right? In 90 days, we're very, very happy to report that we've signed up over 15,000 active users without a dime of paid advertising, 68% of whom are over the age of 55. And in fact, our median user age is 68 years old, right? 
These are older, aging Americans with chronic disease who nobody believes will use apps in the first place, who aren't just using our app, but they're the earliest adopters and most avid users of our app. Oh, that is pretty amazing. All right. So what's the use case? Because I think this is what's interesting from what I looked ahead of time, and I think it will come a lot better from you, is what it can do for the user. So yes, it's free. Someone sees it on news. And it's not the ability to read your prescriptions. It's not the ability to make appointments for you. It's the ability to get advice. So what is that like, you know, when you're having to deal with generative AI and making sure that it's verified and, you know, you're not having hallucinations, you know, AI hallucinations and all that? Yeah. So it's an interesting question. The first thing to remember is there are features in this app, you know, taking pictures of your pill bottles or looking at a preventive health list or whatever, right? The most important thing to know is that we do not use generative AI to draw any open-ended conclusions or to give you medical advice, right? Okay. We don't do that. What we do is use generative AI for closed-end answers in an unprecedented way. What does that mean? What's the difference? My insurance benefits plan for my Blue Shield of California insurance plan is about 100 pages long. Everyone's is about 100 pages long. And everyone, mm -hmm. once they sign up for health insurance, get that thick book that says explanation of benefits. Nobody reads the book. What AI can do exceptionally well is to, I can upload that book as a PDF to AI and re, have it read the book and then say, what is my copay to go to an acupuncturist? And I'm picking something unusual that most people don't use. And it will explain to me in a fraction of a second that your copay to go to an in-network acupuncturist is $15 and would you get 12 sessions a year and would you like to see a list of in-network acupuncturists in your area? There's no way AI will get that answer wrong. It can't hallucinate because you're giving it a 100-page data set against which to search, right? That is what how we use AI. How we don't use AI is I have type 2 diabetes, cure it for me, Right. For that, what should I do tomorrow? Yeah. Right. Yeah. What we do use AI, I'll give you another example for it, is we'll remind you to take your blood pressure medicines and we'll remind you to measure your blood pressure. And we make it possible for you to measure your blood pressure by pointing a camera at your face so you can do it from anywhere. You don't have to have a device. You don't have to spend money. You don't have to wear it correctly. You have to point a camera at your face, right? Everyone who's ever taken a selfie can do this. Yeah. Now, let's say you started on a blood pressure medicine and you're measuring your blood pressure every day and your blood pressure isn't coming down. Well, we'll do a correlation analysis. And what we would say to you is you've been taking this medication correctly for 30 days and you haven't seen an improvement in blood pressure. You should talk to your doctor and discuss these results and ask them if they want to make any changes. Then we will schedule that doctor's appointment for you. Now you're going into the doctor's office or talking to them on the phone and the doctor is looking at actual data, right? That chart that we produce and saying, you know what? I want to change this medicine or I want to increase the dosage or I want to try the different medicine. The doctor is making that decision. But typically imagine that against the current status quo. You go into a doctor's office and what does the doctor's office say? Have you been, Nick, have you been taking your blood pressure medicines? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah basically, because they feel like they're supposed to say yes. They don't say, well, I've missed half my doses. They don't, they don't say that. Yeah, well, how's yeah. your blood pressure doing? Well, I don't know. I haven't measured that often. It feels good, right? But nobody knows what their blood pressure is unless they measure it and meticulously write it down. And they do it at the same time every day. And they do it in the same conditions every day. And they haven't just run a mile. And they don't have to pee. And they're not having an unusually stressful day. We're able to do that and suggest that they more proactively go see their doctor. So it's not six months or a year later before the doctor takes corrective action on a medicine that might not be working. Uh, I like that a lot because I do think it's kind of cool that you are using the actual things. Because I just did for one of my clients insurance issues peo and it was literally just you know a 50 page you know how do you document non-compliance of work you know the whole lovely language yeah. and it was insane and he was getting run around 20 minute long videos they created that you have to follow and we just dumped it into claude and kind of got this whole yeah. Like, oh, step one, step two, step three. So I love that you've built it and you've taken it further than just the ad hoc nature. 
you know, it just shows you can go much further. You can go how to work with the insurance, how to then play with the data. And if you're generating your own data, are you playing with Apple's health kit at all? Or is that some, as you were talking, I was playing with my aura ring. So we are planning an integration to Apple health kit to get some of those data points that you can't measure just from looking at your face, body temperature, sleep activity. But our general view is that most people don't like other than fad and other than, hey, I'm wearing it for a little while or those kinds of things. Yeah. Most people don't like wearables and people will forget them. They, okay. you know, they, they, they're intrusive in a way that you don't want, right? What is always best is an ambient sensor or a passive sensor, right? So having the camera, point the camera at your face is something I can do literally from anywhere, anytime right? But not everything can be measured that way. Imagine that sleep was measured instead of using a ring of any kind by an ambient sensor that was in the corner of your room or by, you know, most smart TVs nowadays have a camera in them, right? Now, obviously with the user permission, not violating their privacy, but if a person says yes, imagine that that camera is pointing at, where's the TV? It's pointing at the bed. That's how people watch TV. It could track your sleep and compute for you and you wouldn't have to remember anything and you wouldn't have to wear anything, right? So, and you wouldn't have to charge anything. The TV always stays plugged in, right? So our view of this is that the more ambient stuff gets, the more in the background, the more automated, the more intelligent and the more integrated, right? And the integration is key, right? It's not necessarily important that you didn't sleep well one day. We're all adults. We're all busy people. And every now and then some of one of us, it's important that you're not sleeping well every day, right? It's important, not important that your blood pressure is high this second, right? Unless it's 200 over something, right? Consistently. Yeah. Is it going up? Is it going down? Right? Is it in general heading in the right direction? If you miss one day of your metformin, you're not going to die. It's not going to, you're not going to get diabetes. If you miss half your doses, it's not going to help you either, right? These are the kinds of things that we are trying to look at and compute and show to people and help them complete day-to-day routine healthcare tasks. There's a ton of stuff out there. Let's get you to a doctor and get you a care plan, okay? That care plan is like an architectural drawing of a house. doesn't mean you have a roof over your head. Someone has to build the house, right? And most people don't know how to build their own house. If you gave most people an architectural plan and all the wood and all the stuff in the world for free, they wouldn't be able to build a house. I wouldn't, right? It's the same thing in healthcare. That function is called care coordination. It's actually what you do every day. Do you take the meds? Do you do the thing? Do you do the yoga? Do you get the physical therapy? Do you do all of this stuff? That's what we're helping people make sure that they do in the easiest, uh, most intelligent possible way. All right. So you have 15,000 people. You're expanding out. You raise some funds. You were talking about your investors. Where is Together App going? Like, is it just you're still trying to build out the case? What's the situation? We think that the engagement data over 90 days on these first 15,000 people is really exciting, right? 71% of our users are using the app three or more times a week. They're using it for all the reasons we would hope them to use it for. And the result of that is that we think we have early indications of product market fit. And so we're raising additional capital to go big, right? Obviously. And, but the ultimate vision here that is really important is that what Renee always says, everyone needs, when it comes to healthcare, everyone needs a little help, right? And we want to be that help. We want to be, that's why we're a free to consumer app that is, designed to make it incredibly easy to complete or automation automate the completion of the most important healthcare task. 80 million Americans have two or more chronic disease. Those 80 million Americans consume 92% of healthcare costs. The home front page story in the Washington Post today, if it hasn't been uh, debunked by uh, or moved, uh, it's now the second story on the Washington Post because there's this whole Speaker McCarthy getting replaced story now, Something. right? Or losing yeah. the speakership. <laughs> uh, the epidemic of chronic illness is killing Americans in their prime. Amongst people under 65, chronic illnesses erase more than twice as many years as overdoses, homicides, suicides, and car accidents combined a post-examination found, right? That is what we're attacking. That is what we're treating. And the important thing is that there are things that can happen to any of us that you can't prevent. 
walk out of here, get in my car, get into a car accident, die, get on a plane crash, whatever. Things happen to people. There was a lady yesterday mowing a golf course in Ohio, uh, mowing the grass at an airport in Ohio and got cut in half by an airport wing. Okay. Crazy random thing that happens to people, yeah. right? We can all get found out that we have a late stage cancer that is not easily detected. I, had, I lost a best friend to pancreatic cancer, right? But most things, type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, high cholesterol, depression, anxiety, and many cancers can be effectively treated to the point where they have no negative impact on your quality of life or life expectancy. And to do those things, you have to do four things. See your doctor, take your medicines, track your vitals, get preventive exams. We help you do those four things. Nice. And you're constantly creating that refinement of what is supposed to be beneficial for this person by keeping track of everything, having the data profile. It's so great that it's in this friendly front end piece, but at the back of it, it's just this rich data set that all of us want someone, you know, just also, and you know, I'm 54 and I'm playing around with like every test known to the man. And like now all of a sudden my doctor's like, we need to check to make sure. And I'm like, I have to track this one down, that one down, all that. I love the sound of this, just like, I don't have to worry about this part. And it's not throwing the responsibility onto a doctor and hoping the doctor keeps it. You know, it's a piece of technology that, you know, will have my information, have my loved one, my parents, you know, information and just be able to constantly adapt and keep us on track. I mean, that's pretty cool around doing that. So this is free to the consumers or is this something that the insurance companies, you know, because I know there are different programs from insurance companies to create efficiency. Where does, you know, where does Together with Renee make its money then? Together by Renee makes its money by sponsorships, for lack of better words, not advertisements, okay. from Big Pharma and without ever violating your privacy ever, and uh, health insurance yeah. companies. So Together by Renee is brought to you by Ozempic, right? Or brought to you by yeah. whatever. Without ever disclosing your information to them, it's not advertising. Yeah, yeah. It's none of those things. And down the line, we're looking at some other interesting models, but the model is primarily that the people that use our app are people that insurance companies and big pharma companies want to reach. Now, I mean, and I know one of the iterations of Renee was that sort of help in finding with your pharmaceuticals, you know, discounts on that. And I like that model because it's like, yes, if you work, if that's what you want, great. You don't have to use it. The targeting is great. I've done pharma advertising back when I, before I sold my agency, we had a bunch of pharma clients and this type of reach, it's very hard to get that yeah. fine tune. So here it is, you know, yes, you won't share with us the names, but you'll definitely be like, yeah, we can get these people that fit the likelihood of. Yeah, we 22% uh, of our users have type 2 diabetes. We can show your ad to those 22% and we're not sharing any more information with you, right? But the users won't see a barrage of ads. It's not going to become a wasteland, a hellscape of ads as Facebook is nowadays called. It's going to be just one sponsorship message, subtly placed, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I like that. And it's also, I mean, on the flip side, you could also have the targeting of not being able, not giving someone a name, not giving an address, but being like, well, this zip code or this region has a higher likelihood, so you may want to reach out to doctors in this region to do educational yeah. programs for that. Yeah, and, and down the line, it could be helping people find doctors, helping people find therapy, helping people find online tools that help them more effectively, you know, hey, I can't get to a physical therapist, but there's physical therapy online and charging those people affiliate fee, right? And those kinds of things, you know, it could be, certainly could be that kind of thing. All right. So you're out raising another round or is it a continuation round or? It's a continuation. We're raising a bit more uh, capital, about $4 million more million. Uh, we hope to close it over the next month and go from there. All right. Well, good luck with that. I mean, this is very, very cool, you know, science fiction back in the day was this sort of just avatar there to help guide us and keep keep us on the right path sounds yep. like you guys are much further along and starting to do something really interesting here 
really we're, excited we're pretty excited we about where we're at and and where we can get and we enjoy building in the space ai is i say this to people all the time that i i'm I the benefit of age or or the disbenefit of age depending on how you look at it but i've been around firsthand for the pc revolution right the computer on every desktop and in every home and then the internet came along and i i mean that was after grad school that the consumer internet became a thing right and after I went to grad school, that is, and and then the mobile phone, and then sort of high speed internet, and then internet 2.0, and then smartphones, and the iPhone, and app based ecosystems, and the cloud. Right, AI is a more transformative revolution that will move more quickly than all those previous revolutions combined. I fully agree, and the crazy thing is just thinking, you know, a year from now. We're not on a path of, you know, like, oh, it will be twice. It will be three. It will be exponent. You know, I hate to throw that word around, but it's going to be a whole different concept. In computing power, right, and GPUs and what today we're at GPUs and the, the best chips NVIDIA can make in two nanometer transistors. But in 10 years, imagine that this is done on quantum computing, right, that something that has three or 400 qubits and has evolved within the span of my five-year-old daughter becoming a teenager, right, uh, when she's 13, the world will have changed again and again and again to the point where the intelligence from computers is indistinguishable. And I'm not talking about some uprising of Terminator and the machines and all that. Actually, if it's done right, like any technology, yeah, there are downsides, but it can be done in a way that improves the lives of millions and millions of people. Overall, yeah. Disruption is just part of technology, but generally yep. technology improves people's lives, the overall yep. amount. There'll be pockets and there'll be transitions and disruption. Yep. But overall, yes, there are always the risks. It marches the arc of human evolution forward. Generally we move forward. And no, uh, this I yep. I agree. I think yes, there are some worries and stuff, but you know what? An AI overlord or plural, eh. Compared to some of the things, as you just mentioned, <laughs> yeah, the front page. I'm much more worried about what some of the humans in our society are doing than what any machine will do. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of getting to be like, okay, folks. And that's just this one country, even though we're pretty big. Yeah, if we expand out, I think if there's a few things we could use a little help on. I'm definitely going to download the Together app. I think this is a lot of fun. So other than going to download the app, what else can the audience do? Yeah, you know, if they want to learn more, see what you're doing. Honestly, we would love for them to go to the their iPhone app store, type in Together by Renee, and you can download the app and try it out for yourself. And that is honestly the best way to learn more. You're, it's completely free, free to download, free to use, free forever, like we like to say. And if you don't like it, delete it and you're done, but you will like it. All right, cool. Well, Nick, I really appreciate you coming back. I've been excited, you know, as you've a little burst of like, oh, we're changing something. We have something coming, you know, this. I've been excited to hear where this is and now to get to play with this. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for keeping us abreast of what's going on. And I am so excited to uh, see where you go next. And good luck raising that round. Thank you so very much. Great to be on the program and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, definitely. We'll have you back. Up the next. All right, everyone. Remember, go check out Together by Renee on the App Store. I think it would be a lot of fun. And just listen to the other episode. We'll put that in. The logical thinking that has continued from then to now, you know, it is kind of right before the first boom of the AI to now, even though AI has been, but that first sort of like, oh, wait, you can do things. It's really cool that the logic is still there, but it's so much further as possible. So I think you'll get a kick out of diving into this. I think Nick and his wife are doing something really cool. And look, if you like this episode, please give us a review on your favorite listening platform of choice. And that way I can find other really cool entrepreneurs like Nick to come on the show and talk about what they're doing. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.